Scott Holiday, and it is the end of the year, so I hope you are ready for another look back at the year 2022. But before we can get to that, let's plug in. January 2023 in two different locations, there are two opportunities to join Combat Zone Wrestling. It is the CZW Scouting Combine, January 8th in Maryland and Sunday, January 15th at Studio Z in Blackwood, New Jersey. Email talent at czwrestling.com to reserve your spot. I will also be on the call for High Tension Wrestling Spring Breakdown March 18th at Penn's Landing Catering. Tickets will go on sale in the new year. Also, if you're just looking to hang out with me, head on down the National Harbor this weekend. I will be at MAGFest, so be sure to just find me and give me a point and say hello, because I'll be at MAGFest all weekend. We've already taken a look at the best of 2022. It's only fair, if not a little mean, to talk about the worst of 22. Here are the awards for the worst of 2022, according to this idiot. Worst promo. We start the awards with what I thought was the easiest one to give out. This is easily the most damaging promo of the year. It might even be the most damaging promo of all Time. The amount of money lost with this singular promo is astronomical. I'm old, I'm tired, and I work with fucking children. CM Punk's infamous words at the All Out, All Out? I think it was All Out, the All Out Presser damaged not just himself, but various members of the company and AEW in a huge way. The only people to benefit from this promo were the people who owned the muffin company that he was eating during this. Easily the worst promo. And I know it exists outside of kayfabe, kind of, but the all-out pressure, like the purpose of that, is for promotion purposes solely. So it was definitely a promo and one that went horribly wrong. Worst storyline of the year. Now, I was tempted for this one to make this nice kind of similarity thing where the best storyline was Chris Jericho's run with the ROH title and make the worst storyline Dolph Ziggler's run with the NXT title because I found that to be rather pointless. It was just another accolade to throw on Dolph Ziggler, who used to be my favorite wrestler, and somehow the WWE made sure I don't care about him at all. I was also considering giving this to whatever's going on with Private Party. Private Party used to be my favorite tag team in AEW. And this Matt Hardy, my contract's not under my control storyline has been going on forever. So please, we need to end it. But I have to pick something in my opinion, because this is my award show, that's over. Like, there is still hope for the private party storyline that something good may come out of it. I want to look at something that happened and then fell off a cliff and now it's over and as a complete work we can say, man, that was terrible. And I can't think of anything worse than Ezekiel. I honestly don't understand what the game plan was here. Like... They did this storyline before, and it worked with Hulk Hogan and Mr. America. And the reason that worked is we as the audience all knew that was Hulk Hogan. It's just that Vince couldn't prove it. With this storyline, were we supposed to believe that Elias and Ezekiel were different people? Like, what, what was the canon of this? In the end... I don't think it was ever really truly answered if Elias was lying the whole time or if we're actually supposed to believe that in the universe of the WWE he has a brother named Ezekiel. And most devastating was this was the storyline they gave to Kevin Owens right after main eventing WrestleMania with Stone Cold. Now, I know some might argue that he was injured and they needed to do something with him, but not this. 
They didn't need to do this. They should have never done this. And there was also no stakes to it. Like, let's go back to the Mr. America thing. The reason Hulk Hogan was wearing a mask was because Hulk Hogan wasn't allowed to wrestle in the WWE at the time. He had been sent home, so he put on a disguise so he could still show up. If Kevin Owens discovered that Ezekiel really was Elias, what would have happened? Would he just have shrugged and been like, you got me? No stakes. There was no crime. There was nothing wrong with what he was doing. He was just kind of doing a weird thing. Why should we care? At least, I know I didn't. Worst finisher of the year. I'm gonna be honest, I'm breaking the rule that I kinda set up in the first video, where I wanted to pick a finisher that was very 2022. I didn't want to just pick a terrible finisher that's been around for a while and be like, this continues to be bad. However, there is one wrestler who was repackaged many times this year, giving them a great opportunity to give this wrestler a new finisher. And each time they repackaged this wrestler, they didn't bother to do that. To be honest, they didn't think through a lot of things with those repackages. And that's the woman's right. Lacey Evans is a wrestler that I like, but they haven't figured out how to use her correctly. I personally liked the stay classy, kind of like 1940s thing she was doing before. Now she's just kind of there, and her finisher is a punch in the face because it's a pretty decent pun. But when your finisher is a punch in the face, I don't see a reason logically for Lacey Evans to ever hit another strike. Like, if your finisher is a right hand, you should never throw a chop because you could have just thrown that right hand. Like, I was playing um, WWE 2K22 recently, and for some reason, one of the moves in the move list for Big E is a power slam, which is ridiculous because that would mean that Big E would get you into position for the big ending and then not do it. The woman's right could be hit at any moment because it's just a punch in the face. It should happen immediately and constantly. It's just bad to be a finisher. It could still be a great signature move to kind of set up something. Lacey Evans has a great moonsault. I don't know why we're not using that as a finisher instead of... Yeah. Most overrated. Honestly, this one made me feel guilty because I don't like the idea of saying, hey, you shouldn't be as popular as you are. But I did my due diligence and tried to figure out something, and I really struggled to find someone that I think deserves this award. So I just kind of went through it, all the champions. Roman Reigns, amazing. Deserves all the accolades. Uh, the Usos, also incredible, so nothing wrong there. Uh, Walter, I refuse to call him Gunter. Love him doing great, had a match of the year contender with Sheamus. Uh, Austin Theory, I think he fulfills his role well. I actually like what he's doing. Uh, Bianca's incredible. Ronda? Ronda, I think, has dropped down a few pegs, but I think they're still using Ronda the way that they should. She's a decent heel in her current spot, so let's jump over to the other company. Uh, MJF, incredible. Mox, well, that was my wrestler of the year, so I'm not going to say that. The Acclaimed, everybody loves The Acclaimed. Everyone that's held the trios titles, great, love them. Uh, Hook, not quite. I think we know Hook is on the ascension, and that's what makes Hook so entertaining. So I think we know that he's not world championship material right now. He's right where he should be. Same goes for Jade Cargill. I understand she's not the greatest wrestler of all time, but we all know that. This is just an ascension for her, an ascension into a higher guard here. And by making her valuable, by making her undefeated, all of the energy we're putting into Jade is really going to be funneled to whoever beats her. 
So I don't think she's overrated. I think we all understand that. So that brings me to the person I am going to give this to, and I think it's going to surprise you. I'm going to say the most underrated person in wrestling right now is Taz. People used to love Taz. People continue to love Taz. He's fun. He makes jokes. He makes things entertaining. And that was fine when it was on Dark. Now that he's on Dynamite, I find him to be very disrespectful distracting and very disrespectful to the action going on because we got to hear all his bits constantly and the bits aren't about what's happening it's always about what's going on at the broadcast table and when your commentary goes to being about you instead of the people putting their bodies on the line I think that's a bit horrible and I will say I might be being a little unfair you might think I'm being a little unfair because I do watch it on fight so I get the commentary that's actually happening during a commercial. So it gets a bit looser there because, ah, it's not like anyone's hearing it. But I'm hearing it! That's part of the service of buying it on Fight! That doesn't mean you get to just chill out and be goofy because the people on TBS aren't hearing it. I still am, and I'm very annoyed. So I'm going to say overrated goes to Taz. Don't kill me. Worst non-wrestler. So since I give Taz overrated, I think we'll stick with this whole non-wrestling uh, part of the world of wrestling. And there is a guy that every time I see him, I just lose a connection. <laughs> and that's Alex Morvez. It just seems like every time he does an interview backstage, he's just rushing so it's over. And he never seems to be reacting to what's happening. He seems to just be a very nervous mic stand that doesn't really know what to do and is disconnected from the reality around him. And it drives me insane. So I have to give it to Alex. Most overutilized. So this is an interesting one. This is me saying that they're used too much. It doesn't mean that they're personally bad. It's just that they've been overexposed a bit. And to me, this is a very easy and obvious choice because I love Keith Lee and I love Swerve. I hate Swerve in our glory. Honestly, it was a good idea at the beginning. I was shocked when they won the tag titles, but how many times have they broken up at this point? I feel like every match they turned on each other, whether it was a miscommunication or an abandonment or all these things, it's just been since they formed this long, unending road to their breakup. And now that they're finally broken up, I don't even want to see them wrestle. I just want them away from each other because I'm so over this storyline that... You've delayed the payoff so much that it's just rotten now. So, overutilized, swerve in your, our glory. I even said their name wrong at the end. Meanest wrestler of the year. The spoiler. The spoiler has been nothing but horrible to me at every show that I've had the unfortune of running into him. Please stop encouraging him. He makes my life horrible. He's mean and nasty and manipulative and I don't like him. Worst return of the year. We've had a lot of returns this year and not all of them have been great. I think the obvious choice for this one is Shane McMahon returning in the Royal Rumble, but honestly that resulted in him never coming back again. So net gain if you really think about it. To me, what's worse than that is when someone returns with no build, no fanfare, and then just loses. Like, it really hurt to see Trent Seven appear out of nowhere just to lose to Orange Cassidy. And I love Orange Cassidy, but it's Trent Seven. <laughs> he should be more. He should have been built. I'd love to see in AEW a vignette of a coming soon. They've never done it. They love to do the surprise, but I think a build every once in a while would be great. And speaking of surprise returns, WWE, it feels like, fired a bunch of people so that they could have surprise returns throughout. 
and a lot of them have fallen flat. I don't think Braun was impactful as they would think. Johnny Gargano wasn't as exciting and ended up in this weird Miz storyline. And I was going to give this award to Emma. Because I love Emma. She showed up with no fanfare and then just lost. And now she's just kind of lost in the roster. And I was like, there's no way they could do it worse. And then they did it worse. My award for worst return, I'm so sorry, goes to Tegan Knox. It's because I love Tegan Knox. I think Tegan Knox is a fantastic wrestler with so much character and personality. But I remember watching it and when I heard, oh my god, it's Tegan Knox. My response was, it is? That's, that's not Captain Marvel. That's like a mermaid or something. They took Tegan Knox and completely transformed her to the point that she was unrecognizable. And, and for what? The storyline is not doing anything for me. It's just kind of existing and there, and it's just another person. It's just so annoying, especially when you consider that she could have come back in the Mia Yim spot. No offense to Mia Yim, but bringing in Tegan Knox to join the OC makes more sense to me because Rhea Ripley crippled her. Remember that? Remember back, I know we're going way back in the, the Mae Young classic where Tegan Knox was taken out because she could no longer continue. And then Rhea Ripley was dressing up as Tegan Knox for Halloween on crutches. No vengeance ever took place. None. There is a great reason for Tegan Knox to want to come back and shut up Rhea Ripley. But instead it was just Mia Yim because reasons. It's such a squandered opportunity. It's not an insult to the person. It's simply the way it was done. I'm sorry, Tegan Knox gets this award. Least anticipated return. I feel terrible having this. I mean, I need to make all the awards kind of line up. And since I had anticipated return, it's only fair that I do least anticipated return. But I hate the idea of just being like you, who I haven't seen in a while, don't want you to come back. That seems horrible, especially if they're hurt. It's like, nah, stay injured. That seems really cruel and mean. But I did find someone, and this is not so much, oh, I don't want this person to return. It's me being afraid of how this person is most likely to return. I think, especially with all the recent returns, if WWE really wanted to, their female division could blow any company out of the water. That being said, if Charlotte Flair returns and just walks into a match at WrestleMania, I'm going to be furious, especially if you don't have something for, say, Liv Morgan, who has been working her ass off, reinventing herself with all these new, interesting nuances to just push her aside so Charlotte can strut in as a peacock does not interest me. There's a lot of great wrestlers that have yet to be fully explored. Give me more Shotzi. Give me more Raquel. Give me more Emma. <laughs> Give me these wrestlers that I like that can have great matches. And maybe then you'll build some good opponents for Charlotte Flair. But if she just strolls up and ends up, God forbid, fighting Ronda again, or ends up in a match with probably Becky or Bianca, I'm going to be really disappointed. And I just, I just don't want that. Please... Do something new and interesting. Don't just give someone a vacation so that they can be back when things are more important. Worst match of the year. You know, I've seen a lot of people talking about what the worst match of the year was, and there's one match that I feel like no one is talking about. 
When people say worst match of the year, a lot of people point at the Royal Rumbles, which were both not as great as they should be, but they were still Royal Rumbles. Bad Bunny showed up. It was fun. Uh, people are pointing at the the Brutes versus the New Day. Understandable. Uh, Shotzi versus uh, Ronda Rousey. I get it. You could point to a lot of stuff in NXT, but it feels a bit cruel to point at all these people who are just kind of learning the business and be like, that's bad. They know. It's developmental. They're trying. So let's pick a match that has a veteran in it that went really bad. So bad that this match should not have happened. You gotta say that the worst match of the year is Ric Flair's last match. What were we thinking? Everyone watching that watched it like this, just afraid that the worst was going to happen. And then they pretended that it did. Like, if you haven't seen it, there is a moment where Ric Flair, who has a pacemaker, fakes a heart attack so he can get an advantage. What a horrible thing to scare everyone into doing. Especially because he passes out later in the match. Like, there's an actual medical emergency, but you've already trained us to ignore it. So dangerous. So horrible. And nothing gained. Except a lot of money, I'm sure, for Conrad. That's, okay, so one thing gained. A lot of things. Dollars. But other than that, as a wrestling match, horrendous. Worst tag team. Now, again, I feel like I've already mentioned a lot of the, the candidates for this already. Swerve and Our Glory, even though they were champions, were contenders for this. I really don't like the private party storyline, but they're still a great tag team. I mean, I guess I could throw it out the ass boys, but I really think that that's their whole stick. Like, it means they're kind of doing it right, if that's what's happening. I almost gave it to the Trust Busters, just because I don't understand the Trust Busters. I feel like they were getting a lot of attention for reasons I didn't understand. And if they're going to do like a Million Dollar Man gimmick, they got to turn that up a little bit. We need more volume on the whole Million Dollar Man thing, buying things and, you know, using money to talk instead of wrestling. You need to do that if that's the gimmick. But as much as I hate double dipping, I am going to go back to the previous well and say that the worst tag team is Jay Lethal and Jeff Jarrett. Now, I'm going to be honest. The dime that was drawn by Jeff Jarrett's banging guitars was me. I actually really like Jeff Jarrett. I think he's very interesting. I loved that he fought Effie in GCW. I was happy when he showed up in the Royal Rumble a little while ago. I like Jeff Jarrett. But in the world of professional wrestling, what this team has done was lose to a 70-year-old man in his last match, show up in AEW, and then become number one contender. Like, what have they done that made them deserve a match with the Acclaim? Be annoying? <laughs> That's it? Like, if we want to build credibility, they need to win some matches. And I understand you can take it as, well, they're heels and you're supposed to be upset that they're not good and that they haven't proven their way. That's true. And that's a valid argument, but it's also discrediting the tag team division and the tag titles. If these two people can just stroll in and get a title shot, it devalues what those titles mean. Like the fact that at the exact same time you have the ass boys targeting FDR because that's more important than the AEW tag titles is a problem. And I think they don't realize the damage they're doing to their overall company by putting the spotlight on Jay Lethal and Jeff Jarrett. Just have them feud with someone else first. Like, I think you take those two and you have them feud with Top Flight first. I'd probably like them. Because then it's this whole veterans versus the new guys thing. And you got the, the flippy boys doing all the flippy stuff. And then you have Jeff Jarrett using a guitar doing this. That's how you build this team. Right now, they're just bad. Worst wrestler of the year. Honestly, the person I'm giving this to, you could probably make an argument 
deserved every single one of these awards. You could make an argument that they have the worst finisher. You could have made an argument that they had the worst match. You could make an argument they had the worst promo. I'm giving this award to Vince McMahon. Now, I will be honest with you. I enjoyed that he had a match with Pat McAfee. I thought it was funny for ridiculous reasons. But you can't say it was a technical masterpiece. He used a clothesline and then his finisher was kicking football. That's pretty bad. Not to mention the fact that he then gave away that Stone Cold was going to come out when he got frightened by Austin Theory's music. There's also the fact that he cut some of the worst promos, which I'm talking about. Welcome to SmackDown. I'm not in legal trouble. Horrible. He's also a non-wrestler. You give him this much. He was definitely on TV too much, considering what was happening. So you could say he was overutilized. People bow down to him like he's a god. That's a bit overrated, calling him god. That's a thing he did. This is not me inventing it. He called himself god for a while. Remember that? I didn't want him to return, and yet he returned, and there is the threat that he's coming back again. You can give every one of these categories to Vince McMahon. That's why he is very clearly the worst wrestler of 2022. And that's going to do it for the worst list. I don't like being negative. It makes me feel bad. I I just, I feel guilty now. So what do you think? are the worst of 2022. Leave that in the comments and then apologize. That's what I recommend doing. That's what I did the whole time. Say something is bad and then apologize to that person down in the comments below. Also, be sure to subscribe right here to Plus Two Wrestling and uh, you'll hear me talk more. It'll come up in your feed, hopefully. Algorithms and such. Thank you so much for watching and you have a great day.